will come to the living a meaningful and fulfilled life you love channel. I usually post a collection of great inspiration stuff I found once a month. So simply click the subscribe button below to be notified through YouTube when I post a new collection. Enjoy! They say being older is, a, what are they called, a not for sissies, or they have that sort of phrase. I, I didn't find life easier when I was younger at all. As a small boy, I loved more than anything being on my own. There was something in me that was self-conscious and anxious when I was around people. Whereas when I was with a tree or a cat, the world was mine in a, in a slightly different kind of way. It was real to me. But it was much less simple when people were involved. <laughs> you know. I have something of the same now, where I do need quite a lot of solitude. The world that I hear when I'm quiet has a simplicity about it, a straightforwardness about it. It feels real in that way. The more I'm willing to make central to my life a stillness, beyond my thinking. I am connected with the world as if it were for the very first time. Being quiet for a moment is the way that I can quieten that voice that says, what's the point of all this? What really breaks my heart is the kind of suffering around of, uh, of people who are, who are motivated, uh, we'd say, by self. The, the, the self of ambition, of greed, of intolerance, of fearfulness. The moment I try and protect myself by saying, I don't want to see the injustice, I turn my head, uh, then I'm, I'm already in a, in a brittle space. And I'm always uh, trying to keep something out. So I do let the injustice and suffering of the world touch me. It's important for me that I feel sad, deeply sad, and sometimes just hugely angry and desperate. I'm not going to become more real by trying to shut off bits of it. My job as a human being is to wake up and find my real connection with this universe and all the people in it, including their suffering. I, you, I take a deep breath. I hear the cries of this world and I stand up again and go out. How do I step into the world? How do I take that injustice that I see and act on that. I tried various meditation techniques and followed gurus and lamas and Zen masters, all of that sort of thing, you know, I read all the books and uh, it never worked, of course, uh, predictably now, because I was looking outside of myself for something from, from someone else.
That's in fact one of the Buddha's earliest teachings. Don't believe any authority, any scriptures, any wise men. Find out for yourself what's, what's true, what's real for you. People talk of meditation as a kind of way of reducing stress. You see it in a lot of magazines now when you go to the dentist, yeah. But I think the more one does it, the more it becomes natural to see it as more than just me improving my life, but of finding this life to be deepened and broadened, to include everything in the most natural and uh, immediate and, and light-hearted way. You know. When I do this meditation practice, even though it appears that I'm going inside, what it does is it actually connects me with the world in a way that, that my anxious mind, thinking mind, preference mind, judgment mind, what wasn't able to do. And I find that then I can step with more uh, affection and tolerance and enthusiasm and humor into the world if I step in from uh, taking a deep breath, you know, then I say, hello, Michael, nice to see you, <laughs> you know. perhaps just use the words of a Zen koan. When you meet the Buddha on the road, how do you greet him? Each person that you meet is, quote unquote, the Buddha. So how do you respond? How are you? Nice to meet you. Whether you like them or not, whether you find it easy or not. How can I make compassion real? Whoever they are, and to be able to stand in their footsteps, whoever they are, stand in their shoes. Sometimes it may be obviously more charitable stuff, donation here, looking after the elderly. Sometimes it's just listening to someone else. We're not talking of fireworks in the sky and angelic choirs. We're talking of you and me meeting each other so that compassion is not a romantic ideal that one's measuring oneself again, but simply an expression of the fullness of this moment. I don't feel afraid of being dead. What frightens me is of not living fully before I die. That's, that's a kind of terror. <laughs> How can I just allow this life to be mine in the deepest way, including the fact that I don't get it right? I 
I just need to be genuine and sincere in the best way that I can. So that if I don't wake up tomorrow, uh, that's fine. I would like to think that the life I lead will help others in theirs, but I have no objection to being scattered in the felt and uh, being forgotten at all. Thanks to all of you who helped make this film possible. All of our films are totally crowdfunded. So if you'd like to continue to support us on our journey, check out our Green Renaissance page on Patreon. The past few years I have heard people, including my inner voice, tell me you should do more, you should be more. There's this unconscious feeling of never being enough. Maybe you have experienced this too. And it can be even harder if your values and actions are not aligned with the expectations of other people. But you should still be you and live life on your own terms. That's why I created this video to share what has helped me to stay confident and happy while many times not following the social norms. One super important thing that I'm now starting to realize is that my own self-worth is not tied up to my productivity or some possessions that I have or could have or don't have. I read this article this week that it was like an interview from somebody who works in a care center that take care of people who are uh, like the last weeks of their life before they are dying to some disease she said said that of course she does like physical things like give medicine and all that but a lot like emotional comfort as well and most people there say that it didn't matter what they did in their lifestyle in their during their life in terms of work or what they owned or like would regret that they didn't have more money many times it was just that they feel like they would spend more quality time with people that they love and i think there's a lot we can learn from those people that don't kind of have anything to lose anymore when you stop that caring when you are letting go of all that i think then you can realize exactly things like this that you are worthy even if you wouldn't push always that hard even if you wouldn't make that certain amount of money or you would have just ordinary life because you cannot put a condition to yourself that I am enough if something else that comes so much from the ego when you're seeking for that validation from others or validation even from yourself that you feel like I am worthy if I finally get that job if I finally find that career that I wanted in my life if I do four meditations a day if I finally find a partner in my life I don't think all those things come from a bad place but I think it's important to understand that whether you achieve those or whether you have just very ordinary life and don't achieve a lot of success in all the areas of your life still you are enough still you are worthy i heard this good metaphor for this like if you would have a 100 dollar bill and you would throw it on the ground and someone would step on it how much would it still be worth and of course the answer is 100 so it doesn't matter so much like what's exactly the condition to outside what matters is that value and it always stays the same and same goes for you Another really helpful thing is finding your North Star. Finding what's your vision, where do you want to go, what are in your life areas, kind of the so-called tense. So what is the maximum thing that you can like think of, what is the ultimate level, like the end goal where you can be in that. Once you understand that it's so much easier to understand what you are like kind of more than satisfied with of course you could be fat satisfied for like 7 out of 10 but 10 out of 10 is like the absolute maximum knowing this in your life for example what what type of activities do you want to do what type of home do you want to have it gives you so much clarity on where you are in your journey now and where do you want to go and what that gives you is a lot of confidence you are not anymore just trying to in a dark forest go somewhere you are exactly knowing where you go you know that that that's the path that's the trail and you are following that so in terms of simplifying life uh, for me it could be that i find a home in a little bit more calmer environment i set up some habits that will calm my mind a lot and not buying so many clothes or other possessions but keeping it 
keeping kind of my life very intentional in that sense because I think simple living is something that it's very different for everybody we all have our own definitions of it that's why it's so important to know what's your vision what's your goal what's your north star so I'm filming while I'm putting the clothes to dry I just thought that it's nice you know to talk about this simple life while I'm <laughs> doing very ordinary things so the third thing that has helped me a lot is remembering the why to write down why you want to simplify your life in the first place what is the thing that you are kind of afraid of or what's the the opposite thing what's the other option so what would happen if you don't simplify your life for me it would be that i'm just living a life that i would regret later i would probably do things and make decisions that wouldn't make me feel happy for example I have a very addicted mind, I have realized that. For example, for TV series, so I could buy, you know, the biggest TV and bunch of subscriptions for different uh, types of streaming platforms and then just use all my time to do those. And I feel like after 20 years, if I would just do that, I wouldn't achieve many of the things that I want to achieve in my life. For example, creating these YouTube videos. I would probably have a lot of like difficulties mentally if I would do that. Especially in the moments when you feel like a little bit less confident. Those really, that really helps that you have, you know, the why written down somewhere and you can go back to and remember that uh, this was exactly the big reason why I started this and it gives you the inspiration to continue. I like these super cozy lights that we put here. The fourth one is to listen to others but realize that we all have our own opinion. We all are different and I think that that's the beauty of life but most people are not many times understanding you. Like if you, if you tell them that you don't need more, you are exactly where you are supposed to be and you have enough already. There are so many different opinions and it's, it's good to listen to others to get you know new ideas and realize and understand what are other people doing, be curious about those. But just if somebody tells you that you are doing something wrong, you should do this because it worked for me, you should take that as an opinion, not as the true fact, because most likely you know yourself better than the other person knows you. But what is super important is that you engage with other people and other communities that share similar values as you do. So for example, if you think that living a simple lifestyle, slower lifestyle and aligned with your values is exactly what you want to do I think that this channel is exactly your place it's your community because it's sometimes so hard to be just alone and trying to keep away you know all those distractions and all the different values and comments and opinions that come and kind of stay on their lane if you don't have that community support if you don't have that like reinforcement currently all the time that what you're doing is correct you're on the right path just uh, trust yourself and trust the process and not trying to jump from different things all the time fifth one is a little bit more advanced i would say that is be aware of your own thinking patterns and that is especially if they are negative and for me this has been really like the most difficult thing because I cannot let go of those thoughts that I should be productive that I should do more I used to have this that every for example bus ride that I have every time I'm walking outside I should be productive I should do something else with my mind otherwise it's a waste of time and I think that this is quite unhealthy thinking because it means that you should all the time be productive and I used to beat myself up a lot if I didn't like do that I was thinking that I'm like a failure I think that these are in our society very unconscious things that comes from the values of you know needing to be important for the for the society and showing up and, and all that and of course as well like it's difficult to just stay in silence that that's another fact for sure but you need to understand that your mind cannot handle all the time being productive you need to give the moments of pause to yourself and it's super important therefore to be aware of your own thinking before you go into that mode where you start to feel very anxious or or bad about yourself and your self-worth goes down because you didn't do something and even if you slip up like you you buy that thing that you ne didn't necessarily need you still need to be kind to yourself and understand that these things can happen not focus on you know the fall 
but focus on getting up. During my journey of simplifying life, I have learned so many things, even sometimes like little bit surprising things. If you want to find out five of those lessons, make sure to check this video next. Remember to stay kind and meaningful in your own beautiful journey. See you in the next one. Ciao. In our quest to understand ourselves and the universe, we can benefit from something the ancient Taoists didn't have. The subsequent two and a half thousand years of human learning. We've learned so much about how we work and if we start with our physical bodies, this is made up of 36 trillion cells and the complexity of life within each and every one of them is astonishing. Every cell in your body is made up of these little entities that all have their own jobs, like the mitochondria who somehow worked out how to convert oxygen and glucose into energy. The mitochondria power every single cell in your body. Every cell is a small world, a microcosm. It's aware of itself ending at its border. It can move towards food and repair itself. And how is it that 36 trillion of them cooperate to make you? Is there a boss of the body? Normally we imagine the brain being the boss, like there's a control centre with TV screens and someone in uniform barking orders. Fun to imagine, but that's not how we work. Let's take your stomach for example, it has a hundred million neurons within it and it can get on with the complexity of digesting your food without any intervention from the brain. The brain needs the stomach, the stomach needs the brain, it's the relationships between all of these parts that make up you. We don't have a boss. Machines need bosses, someone to design the blueprints and assemble the parts together. But we are not machines, we are organisms, we are self-organising. Somehow, spontaneously and marvellously, all these cells come together to create you. But you're more than just the matter within you, because all the stuff within you is constantly changing. Happy birthday, Auntie Gisela. That is me, right? But the longest any of our cells can live is around seven years, so there isn't a single cell in that young boy that's in me now. And so this makes us much more interesting than just stuff, because the stuff within us changes, and yet we persist. Now there are lots of examples in nature like this, and I'm in beautiful Scotland. I want to show you some of the cool things here. So I'm going to jump on my bike, join me, and let's get deeper. This is Akness Falls, a ferocious feature in the local river. And if we ask, is this a thing? I mean, it has a name, tourists come and visit it, but it can't be an object because the matter within it's constantly changing, the water's flowing through it. So when we talk about Akness Falls, we're not talking about a thing or an object, we're talking about a pattern, a consistent feature in the river that persists. The matter passes through, but the pattern continues. And you and I, we are like this. We're not static things with hard edges like billiard balls. No, we are ever moving, ever dynamic processes. The energies of life flow through us, water, food, air. Our cells transform them. They themselves have their own life cycle. They are born and they die. The matter within us changes and yet the pattern persists. Nature is always moving, spontaneous, powerful, creative, and yet we can forget that we are these things as well. For me, with my mental health journey, if I got anxious, I'd beat myself up. If I had a bad week, I'd tell myself I was a failure. I'd convince myself that I was this. But as we are finding, the more we learn about ourselves, the more we realize just how extraordinary all of us are, that there's so much more to celebrate than to criticize. And we can remember this when we look to what is true about human beings in general and nature in general. 
rather than how we feel about ourselves in any given moment. A practice I use to remind myself of this is a simple squeeze of the hand. A simple squeeze of the hand can remind us that no thought can capture the full wonder and mystery of who we really are. So who are we? Ultimately, we are relationship, a colorful constellation of cooperation, a miracle of harmony. We are not dull, static things, but dynamic, vibrant, ever-moving processes. We are not machines, but organisms, spontaneously self-organizing, no boss, no blueprints. Many of us spend a large part of our lives, in one way or another, feeling stuck. That is, in a state where a strong desire to move forward on an issue meets with an equally strong compulsion to stay fixed where one is. For example, we might at one level powerfully want to leave a job in finance in order to retrain in architecture, but at the same time remain blocked by a range of doubts, hesitations, counter-arguments and guilty feelings. Or we might be impelled to leave our marriage, while simultaneously unable to imagine any realistic life outside of it. To act feels horrific, but doing nothing is killing us as well. Every avenue appears shut off. And so one ruminates, turns over the question late at night, tries the patience of therapists, and watches life go by with mounting anxiety and self-disgust. As an outsider, one might be tempted to ask questions to move things on. Why don't you try to enrol in a course to see if you might like a new area of work? Why don't you discuss your dissatisfactions with your partner? Why don't you go to counselling? What about splitting up? But we're likely to find that our friend can't make any progress, whatever we say. It seems as if they are subject to a kind of law disbarring them from progressing. Not the sort of law you'd find in the statutes of the country they live in, but some sort of personal law. A law that might go like this. Make sure you don't achieve satisfaction in your career. Make sure your relationship has no life in it, but cannot be abandoned. Make sure you aren't happy in the place you live in. In order to understand the origins of these laws, we have to look backwards. Difficult childhoods and the complicated families they unfold in might be the originators of a lot of these restrictive, unspoken laws whose impact echoes across our lives. Some of these laws might go like this. Make sure you never shine. It would upset your little sister. Or you have to be cheerful not to let my depression break through. Or never be creatively fulfilled because it would remind me of my envy. Or reassure us that we are clever by winning all the prizes at school. Or we need you to achieve to make us feel okay about ourselves. Or you would disappoint me if you became boisterous and one day sexual. Of course, no one ever directly says such things in a family. Laws couldn't operate if they could so easily be seen. But the laws are there nevertheless, holding us into a particular position as we grow up. And then, once we've left home, continuing to surreptitiously distort our personalities away from the path of their legitimate growth. It can be hard to draw any connection between adult stuck situations and any childhood laws. We may miss the link between our reluctance to act at work and a situation with dad at home 30 years before. But we can hazard a principle nevertheless. Any long-term stuckness is likely to be the result of butting in to some sort of law inherited unknowingly from childhood. We are stuck because we are being overly loyal to an idea of something being impossible generated in the distant past. Impossible because it was threatening to someone we cared for or depended on a long time ago.
Therefore, one of the main paths to liberation lies in coming to see that the law exists and then unpicking its warped and unnecessary logic. We can start by asking whether, beneath our practical dilemma, there may be a childhood law at work encouraging us to stay where we are. We can dig beneath the surface problem in search of the emotional structure that might be being engaged. So, for example, in the unconscious, architecture equals the creativity dad never enjoyed, or sexual fulfillment equals what hurt my lovable mum. We may discover that some of the reason we can't give up on finance and take up a more imaginative role is because throughout childhood we had to accept a law that we couldn't be both creatively fulfilled and make money in order to protect our volatile father from his own envy and inadequacy. Or we can't leave our marriage because unconsciously we're coming up against a law from childhood that tells us that being a good boy means renouncing one's more bodily and visceral sides. The specifics will differ, but the principle of a hidden law from childhood can explain a huge number of adult stucknesses. The way forward is, first and foremost, hence to realise that there might be a law in operation when we get stuck, that we aren't merely being cowardly or slow in not progressing, and that we feel trapped because we are, in our faulty minds, back in a cage formed in childhood, which we have to be able to see, think about, and then patiently dismantle. We can, along the way, accept that we are now adults, which means that the original family drama no longer has to apply. We don't have to worry about upsetting parental figures. Their taboos were set up to protect them, but they're making us ill. We can feel sad for the laws that these damaged figures from the past imposed on us, often with no active malevolence, but we can recognise that our imperative is to move them aside and act with the emotional freedom that's always been our birthright. We may need to be disloyal to a way of being that protected someone we cared about or depended on in order to start to be loyal to a more important person still, ourselves. Our Decision Dice are a tool to help you make wiser decisions in work, love and the rest of your life. I must down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky. And all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. That poem has always struck very deeply with me because the sea is a great solace. It's so wide, it gives you perspective. It's so timeless, and it's part of us all. That connection that humans have with nature, that wild elemental aspect, that's where my heart is, where my soul sings again. Where I can say, okay, I am Christy. And that's all that matters. I am Christy. It doesn't matter if I shake now while I'm saying it. I am Christy. And you know, it's okay to just be Christy. <laughs> I don't have to be something else. At this point in my life, I feel a little bit like a ship that's gone astray. And I'm trying to find the wind that's going to blow me back on course. When I got divorced, it was after 20 years of marriage. You lose something of yourself and you have a lot of grief because of loss loss of love, 
loss of a family life. And there was just a huge load of stress packed right on top of each other. And then at the same time, I realised I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, so that was something that I hadn't actually been dealing with because I'd just been throwing myself into work and my family and, you know, and trying to make ends meet. All of that took its toll on me, and I think it all sort of went... Things were just falling apart, and I basically fell apart. When you're in a really difficult place, you can lose perspective very quickly and you start questioning yourself. You start saying, what am I doing wrong? What have I done to deserve this? I didn't want to feel what I was feeling. I didn't want to feel sad or grief or anything like that. I wanted to, you know, just power through it. I wasn't taught about how to understand what my emotions are. If you don't understand what you're feeling, and if you're not allowed to have feelings, you tend to suppress it all. And that doesn't work, because eventually it's going to come out. You're going to chatter into little pieces, and then you're going to say, oh, look, here's a little piece of grief, here's a little piece of sorrow. It's OK to have grief and sorrow, and it's OK for it to last a long time. Positivity does not mean suppressing the negative emotions. Positivity means that you feel those emotions, but you know you're going to be okay and it's going to change one day. I am scared about what the future holds. The very hard thing is to see how other people worry and what they're feeling. For my kids especially. I don't want them to be stressed by me. I want to be able to be there for them. But I can't take away their pain, you know? That's the sad thing, I can't take away their sadness. I wish I could. But I can allow them to have their pain and to express their emotions and say it's okay to be sad about it. And when crying gets easier, laughing gets easier. So once you cry, you leave a little bit of space for the joy to come in. I think Parkinson's for me has been a silver lining of the cloud. It was a call for me to go slowly. And sometimes you need to go slowly in life, not just because you're tired and exhausted, but because you need to step back and say, what patterns am I repeating over and over that's putting me in a place where my body is aching and tired? I tend to see the best in everybody else, but but I don't see that I deserve it as well. That has been my struggle, is that I'm not sure that I deserve kindness. No, I'm still not sure, but but now I can see, now I'm, I'm more clear in seeing how other people can, you know, how, how kindness works. All it comes down to in the end is loving yourself. Because if you can love yourself, you can love others. And if you're kind to yourself, you can be kind to others. The 
humanity is about the ability to see the beauty in somebody else and to be kind to the other parts. That love which is so intangible, but it's there, it's real, and it's, it's a miracle that we love each other at all. <laughs> it's a complete and utter miracle. Being kind now, I see, is about opening yourself and being vulnerable. And a lot of that is about reaching out to people when you're scared and when you're lonely. And even when I'm depressed and miserable and, you know, and my, the medicine, medicine is not working or, you know, or my body is really inflamed because I'm sick and, you know, I can't get out of bed and I'm supposed to be working. And even those times, there are people who believe in me. I'm eternally grateful. And I cannot ever say how much people have done for me. They just... It just blows my mind that people can be so beautiful and loving and kind. And they have the most warm, generous, amazing souls. People have come in me, to me in my deepest, darkest moments and brought me out into the light again. As my daughter says, if you want a flower, you'll find a flower. You know, you'll find it somewhere. So the learning of where the flowers are in my life, that's been my journey. So even sometimes when I've had a really bad day, then I go outside at night and I just look at the moon and the clouds and then you just think, this is the universe, you know, this whole universe. We're all made of stardust. Uh, you know, just being is a miracle. Just being alive is a miracle. And instead of like berating my poor shaky body, I should actually be saying, bloody well done for getting through this, you know? Well done, I'm proud of you. Thank you, thank you for shaking because you're telling me that I'm not doing something right. That I need to take better care of myself. One can find hope in the smallest of places. The beauty that is out there every day, that gives me hope. But I have hope when I still have me. You can't hope for long-lasting life, so the hope is for a beautiful life. Thanks to all of you who helped make this film possible. All of our films are totally crowdfunded. So if you'd like to continue to support us on our journey, check out our Green Renaissance page on Patreon. Were your socks dirty? <clears throat> so I'm waiting for him to put that as the first question. Is your wife bossy? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are we on now? Yeah. Oh. <coughs> okay. We're always on. Is there a secret to a good marriage? Yes, I, I make the coffee for her in the morning and she makes the tea for me at night. <laughs> I think somebody said at some point, getting married will change your life. That was in a kind of admonishing kind of way. And I remember saying, well, I hope it will. 
And, and it has, <laughs> you know, and it's continually kind of evolving. <laughs> I think we're finding it more exciting the older we get. Uh, you know, we're a bit more frail and, and sort of incompetent about things. But we don't seem to mind that. <laughs> At least I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd recommend it <laughs> to anyone. <laughs> it's probably because we've lost our marbles. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing that I was grateful for that somebody wanted to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> somebody thought I was marriage material. <laughs> I'm married to a man that has an incredible sense of humor and that has helped me to be lighter. I was quite a quiet, serious person before I met him. The first time I met Anthony, I felt like I'd found myself in him. That there was something that felt so at home. This was the first person that I felt I could be completely who I am and be accepted for that. So for me, that has been the biggest lesson and the biggest gift that... <laughs> That, um, that I've received is somebody who accepts me completely for who I am. I hear people say, yes, you need to know yourself in order to, uh, to, to bring that uh, into a marriage. Uh, and I'm sure that's true. To me, it feels slightly different. It's more the willingness to find ourselves in the marriage. That feels a little bit more forgiving and a bit more allowing. Let this relationship change me in whatever way uh, becomes natural in the interaction between us. Can I become such an integral part of this world that it and me are one thing? That we're just willing to allow this flow to become us. It's one of the wonderful things about having a companion is that you see the world through their eyes. It kind of broadens your vision. I can share the things that, that excite me um, and I can share the things that excite her. And sometimes it's difficult to find that excitement and, and we share that as well. By the same token, you see when they're suffering or when they're having a hard time. That's part of seeing it through their eyes. And so immediately there's a sense of uh, reaching out or putting a ladder down into a hole where they've climbed so that they can climb out, you know, or one can climb in and dance down there and say, oh, that darkness is quite fun. You know? um. <laughs> holes and ladders. We play holes and ladders all the time. <laughs> Our relationship is not different to others. It 
sometimes we have the wind behind us and we sail on, and other times we <laughs> tack back and forwards across the choppy waters and we feel we're going to drown. We make mistakes all the time, and getting stuck is sometimes part of the flow. And those are often the times that teach us the most. When I'm really in an uncomfortable place, I've messed up, I've disregarded somebody, I've, I've turned away from intimacy in some way. And then to say, I'm sorry, or can I make you a cup of coffee, or let's go for a walk, whatever it is, to just see if it's possible to move past that point together. The tolerance comes from knowing that that person is lovable, even when you want to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> The older you get, the more tolerance you have to learn because your own tolerance gets less. Um, your own patience gets less. So the little things that come up in marriages and relationships, like, you know, don't wear your best pants to paint in. Um, one doesn't hold on to stuff. You let it go very quickly. I've seen what happens when I don't do it, when I let it fester, when, it, when I take it inward and, and don't let it out. I've also seen what happens when I let it out in a way without reflection beforehand. I think reflection for any human being is vital. And I think that is something that people struggle with now because one is bombarded so much that you don't stop enough to reflect on your life and what you can change or what doesn't feel right and then make that effort. And I think the fact that we're working on that daily, that's the fruit of it. It does happen that strangers come up to us sometimes and say, we were walking behind you and that's what I wish for myself. And all I can say is I, 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 I wish that for you too. I'm just grateful that I have a companion in this life. I realize that for many people, it's not something they have. Lucky is one of the many words to put it. Lucky, grateful, infuriating, <laughs> sure, just a breath of fresh air. I think the words just flood me. And, and that's what feels uh, real about it. Um, if it was a romantic picture postcard, sort of sunset over the sea kind of life, <laughs> I, that sounds terribly boring to me. If you ask me, would I like to change anything now, the answer is no. I, I would just like to go into this with as much enthusiasm as I can figure out so that when I die, not if, when I die, I, uh, I'm happy to, to, to feel that I've led a full life and had great uh, friendship uh, along the way. Yeah. Margie, would you be okay if, if something happened? Not to him. Mm. Um, I would miss him terribly. <clears throat> <laughs> but I feel that I have enough of an internal life that has been fed by my love for him and his love for me that will sustain me.
I don't even know what it means to say, this is destiny, this is the, uh, the answer to my life. It's, it's the life I have and, and she's my life. If that isn't too romantically put. <laughs> Thanks to all of you who helped make this film possible. All of our films are totally crowdfunded. So if you'd like to continue to support us on our journey, check out our Green Renaissance page on Patreon. Yep, this was it for today. Really hope you liked it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, maybe even leave a comment below and subscribe to be notified through YouTube when there will be new videos about living a meaningful and fulfilling life you love. In any case, thank you very much again for watching and looking forward to hopefully see you in the next video.